Welcome to this Killick Explains Finance video. This week, I'm going to shine a light on a fairly murky part of the financial markets that long-term equity investors might wonder, what's in it for me exactly? It's called the repo. And the repo markets are huge, and we need to just ask the question, when something goes wrong there, as it did recently in September, does it matter? It certainly matters in that part of the markets, does it matter more widely? So, for those people wondering what repos are, a bit of that coming up in a moment. Background is what? So, central banks, often engage other banks, commercial banks, around the market in what they call repo transactions. They happen all the time between banks of different shapes and sizes. So if you haven't heard of them, they're actually very common. And they're fairly mundane. This is often known as the, the plumbing. This market is the plumbing that supports a key section of the financial markets. Normally, there's nothing to say. It's like move along, nothing to see really. The repo market functions fairly smoothly. But in September, there was a, in a huge short-term spike in what's called the repo rate, and that drew a lot of headlines. So the question is, what are these things? And does something like that matter more widely than just in the repo market itself? So repo basics, what do these things look like? In essence, we have a sale and repurchase agreement. So the repo is the repurchase bit shortened, if you like. But to call it a sale and repurchase agreement is to ignore the fact that really what this represents is a secured short-term loan. Example coming up in a moment. And that means there are two parties. There are basically two uh, transactions involved, a sale and repurchase, two parties, one doing a repo, and the other, I suppose not surprisingly, doing a reverse repo. So, why would you be doing this thing? Why would you be entering a repo? Well, let's have a look at how these things are supposed to work. Very simplified example coming up. Essentially, two parties, party A and party B, not great imagination there on my side, and the repo is party A saying, right, short term, I need some cash, and I'm prepared to lend bonds that I currently hold to get it. Now, it is called a sale, technically speaking, that bit. All right. And then the second leg is where you back that out. And you'll notice that the bonds go back the other way and a little bit more cash goes from party A to party B. So that is technically the repurchase. So sale and repurchase agreement or repo. But the substance is a secured short-term loan. What do I mean by that? Party A is effectively used, IOUs that it holds, maybe a very short term period, just overnight for example, to borrow cash. When that's unwound, essentially a little bit more cash goes back the other way and the bonds are returned. So it's a way for essentially two parties to solve different liquidity problems. So for party A, it might be a very short term cash requirement that they're trying to fulfill. For party B, it might be they need those IOUs in the short term. And the reason why the two legs have different amounts of cash in is that nobody wants to be faffing around trying to work out accrued interest on um, something that is this short term. A lot of these are just overnight deals. So there it is, a sale and repurchase agreement. Now, the repurchase price of the bonds is usually slightly higher, as we've seen, than the sale price. So that basically just allows the two parties to factor in a little bit of interest using a simple mechanism. It saves the fiddly process of accruing interest on short-term loans, and many repos are short-term, entered and reversed within 24 hours. So there's a very, very basic tour of repos. Now, what's the point? So commercial banks use repos as a source of short-term funding and to make up their cash reserves. So they're useful, as I say, they're flexible for both parties, different motivations. One, temporarily short of cash, okay? The other, temporarily, perhaps short of a particular IOU, the repo makes quite a lot of sense, the reverse repo. It allows lenders to make a small profit on securities lent overnight, so it's a little bit of an extra turn, if you like, on securities that otherwise be sitting inactive, you could say that, lending them out, creates that little bit of extra interest that I mentioned earlier on, and it allows the Fed to influence short-term funding costs, very short-term interest rates. So central banks participate in this market and can have a bearing on, if you want to see it this way, the price at which repo transactions take place. The interest rate, and I use my fingers like that because it is an interest rate, but the mechanics of, a, of the repo market mean that people don't have to faff around actually quoting accrued interest to each other. So, how's it work? How's that Fed intervention work? Well, the price of funding is set by supply and demand in the repo market like it is anywhere else. If institutions that need cash can't get it, then the cost rises. That's reflected in the repo rate. It can be very, very small changes, but you get the idea for new people to this market. 
and the Fed can usually manage this by releasing additional liquidity. So the Fed can, can manage, if you like, um, how that rate changes. Normally it doesn't change very much, frankly, by reducing, increasing the amount of liquidity in various forms that it allows into the market. So that is the mechanism. Now, does this all matter to investors? So here's the question. Well, repo has been called the plumbing that underpins the financial system. I mentioned that earlier on. The overnight value can reach $3 trillion, albeit it's very short term in the sense that normally repos, and re repos are reversed very quickly, can be overnight, and a spike in the repo rate can make the headlines. So normally people are sitting there thinking, well, frankly, is this a very important part of financial markets as a long-term investor? Only, arguably, it makes the headlines. And the reason is, you have to ask the question, what is going on? What would cause a spike in that rate across the market at which essentially banks are prepared to do very short-term deals with each other. Now, people are still trying to work this out. So, some people are saying, don't worry. What happened last month is down to technical timing factors to do with tax receipts, bond issuance, and the activities of the Fed in terms of trying to unwind uh, quantitative easing, as it's known. So far, the central banks managed to react quickly to bring the rate down. So people are saying, no need to worry, because what the Fed did was intervene and the rate may have spiked as people panicked, if you like, about the potential lack of liquidity and then came down very quickly on Fed intervention. But some people are saying none of those explanations quite cut it. Could this be evidence that the Federal Reserve is trying to move too quickly and too unsteadily in trying to unwind all that quantitative easing that was going on post-financial crisis? And is that having an effect in the repo market? In the sense that the biggest players in this market, there are arguably four or five, suddenly panicked about the availability of short-term liquidity. Does that indicate liquidity stress in a key part of the market? Now, I can't give you a definitive answer there. Uh, if it doesn't happen again, I suppose one can conclude there isn't a problem, but nonetheless, people did say, in a part of the market that's supposed to function completely smoothly and predictably, this was an odd event. To find out more about repos and also the activities of central banks, um, editor at killick.com, and or killick.com forward slash learn and have a look down the tabs here, uh, investing principles, be a good one to start on.